I planted this tree uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, they normally, <clears throat> it normally takes them four to five years for maturity. Uh, between the time they're planted and the four or fifth year, they put out little fruit. But uh, they're considered mature trees after five years. I'm Eugene Gutierrez. I'm a World War II vet. Uh, I uh, volunteer to enter the military service August the 5th, 1941. This was uh, prior to the Pearl Harbor attack. I uh, signed up because I wanted to go through and, and continue my education after graduating from high school. But due to the financial conditions of my family and the depression years. Uh, my f family was not able to, s to give us a college education. So I figured if I could sign up th in the military for three years, I would be able to save enough money to maybe start my first two years and there, after that work my way through. I joined the, what was called the Army Air Corps and I was stationed at Brooksville, San Antonio, after my basic training. While I was there, I was uh, attached to the uh, headquarters company that took care of uh, the airplanes for the uh, commander of the, of the, of the base. And uh, at the, right next to it, there was a parachute uh, maintenance uh, department and during my off time I would go visit them and on and on and shortly uh, after the first few visits that I made the uh, manager of the, uh, of the parachute department asked me why don't you come over at a certain time we'll make arrangements so you can learn the way to pack parachutes and how to maintain them and so uh, I did I spent uh, a few months uh, during the day I would maybe take off 15-20 minutes and go visit and eventually I completed the basic course of parachute uh, packing and not knowing that it was going to be put in my service record I didn't pay too much attention. Uh, about six months later uh, which was maybe around no a little more than that uh, around June of, of 1942, I was called into the uh, uh, personnel office at the base, and they uh, <clears throat> said that I had the right qualifications to for uh, maintenance or parachute rigging, and they said, and there is an opening. Uh, I can't tell you where or where it's going to be, but. They're looking for parachute riggers, and uh, we have a representative coming to look at your record. Uh, so they asked me, are you interested in this? I says, well, I'd like to know a little bit more. Uh, he says, well, we can't tell you too much because this is a unit that has a mission and we cannot give any information. So <clears throat> about uh, Toward the end of uh, June, they call me again and says, well, uh, the person that saw your record and uh, uh, we gave him all the data that we have, uh, your past record, what you did, and your education, and, and he would like for you to uh, be a volunteer. I says, well, uh, not knowing what the outcome would be, I says, okay, I'll." 
I'll go ahead and sign up to join the unit. And one of the reasons I signed up was because at that time <clears throat> the war was already underway and there were thousands and thousands of soldiers in the San Antonio area because it's a big military training and military uh, installations there. Because every weekend that we would go into San Antonio, we'd be walking down the main street and all you did was salute officers as they were coming and going. <laughs> I says, gee, I'd like to get away from here and go to a quiet place. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> the orders came out in uh, early July and uh, by the middle of J July we were already boarding the, a train to go to to Montana. Well, actually, we didn't know where we were going. There were three of us, and the uh, sergeant who was in charge had uh, orders not to open the envelope until we were uh, at the next stop, which was Kansas City. And we spent one night there. The next day, we boarded the train, and uh, the uh, trip to uh, Helena took two days from Kansas City. This is my original issue overseas cap that was issued to me in um, August of 1942 when I joined the first Special Service Force. The braid or the um, piping on this cap is yellow with blue and it was a special design for the first Special Service Force when the unit was activated in Helena, Montana in July of 1942. I reported uh, at Fort Harrison in uh, Helena, Montana. And uh, <clears throat> immediately they uh, put us in uh, tents. They didn't have any barracks or any, any uh, quarters like the uh, uh, permanent place did. So we had to sleep in, in tents for about two or three months while the camp was being developed. And uh, when it was developed, then we had uh, what we call Quonset huts, which was big enough for about 20 men. Upon arrival after we had settled down and we uh, reported to the uh, parachute officer to, to the trainer uh, who was in charge of the uh, training for, for the jump school. He uh, put us through the uh, jump school training. We were the first group to go through in uh, late July or early uh, August. <clears throat> and uh, as we were going through the training, uh, American troops started arriving and, and uh, going to their different regiments. Then the Canadians came in, <clears throat> and by the end of uh, the month of uh, November, uh, over 2,000 uh, or 2,500 men had gone through jump school. And that was the first training that they received. When we started our training, uh, being so with the Americans and Canadians. There was a little um, different, as we could tell, but soon after we got into the more serious training, things started coming together. We could understand each other, and that's where the uh, closeness started to take place. And in the combat training, uh, you had to depend on the next person you know, for survival purposes. You had to depend on each other and to be sure that uh, that person was the right person that you would want to be with in, in combat. Uh, the uh, training received was uh, a very great importance in learning to operate together, to, to understand each other, uh, to respect each other, uh, and to uh, be helpful to each other in, in any way possible because once uh, you get into combat, uh, you had to depend on the guy next door to you or the one, or you would have to de 
be the one that would help the other one. I went to the Gold Bar once. It was always a great meeting place. Usually uh, payday was a big day in Helena for the bars. Uh, everybody was out, out there having a good time. And uh, the uh, people in Helena were very, uh, very uh, understanding of the uh, servicemen. Uh, they had great respect for us, and, and uh, we got along very well with the civilian people. I, I was not involved, but I, I saw two or three fights in the parking lots between Americans and Canadians uh, in the early part of the training. Uh, but uh, I guess after that we meld together and uh, the, the fact that you were Canadian, you were American was no longer an issue. Uh, everybody was working together, training together uh, for the mission. Uh, I, I don't think there was any <clears throat> con conflicts uh, as far as um, rank. Uh, Americans would take command uh, orders from the Canadians, and the Canadians would take orders from the Americans. It all worked out real fine. And this is the first time an, an international unit has been activated uh, in the history of the U.S. And I'm sure the history of Canada, too. Some of the uh, people who had lodges out in the mountains would invite us to go uh, hunting with them at times. And, and uh, some, one time uh, I was a guest with a, with a person who had a lodge, and we went out hunting, and one of the guys shot a, a big moose and we brought it back to the mess hall, and we had moose meat there for a few days. <laughs> Colonel Frederick was a uh, very uh, knowledgeable person in military, and he was, uh, his presence was always uh, outstanding when you were near him. He, he was uh, very respectful of his troops, and of course, when you show that uh, character, you can't help but received the same treatment from anybody. I only had one or two occasions to meet him, one was when he pinned the, uh, the airborne wings on me, and then another one um, when we had a parade that he came around and visited and shook hands with, a, with us. But he was uh, uh, a very um, well-liked, leader, and uh, the officers respected him, and, and uh, he didn't take any back. Uh, you made a mistake, you had to be responsible for it. He was uh, the most uh, wounded general or officer that we had, I think, in, in World War II. Also, he was the youngest uh, two-star general in the history of the, of the military. He was um, a genius when he came to uh, military operations. He was the one that, uh, of course, will be down there later, but he was the one that uh, scouted with, with some of his officers the uh, scaling of the, of the Mount La Defensa. I was not in on that La Defensa mission. Uh, they had me in the, uh, uh, the camp, base camp, we were packing chutes uh, because we didn't know if we were gonna be, have to drop supplies. So we were ready to go. So we were close to the, to the airport in Naples in case a, a, uh, supplies or equipment had to be dropped. So the uh, replacements that were brought in had to go through a training conditions. And of course, um, the dependability on who on those recruits. Sometimes, you know, you didn't, the men who were already in the force did not know too much about somebody coming in. So uh, it was a little difficult at the beginning until they went into combat to to um, judge 
the performance of, of recruits or, or newcomers into the unit. Uh, uh, they were selected uh, th through some type of checklist before they would come into the, uh, into the force. Well, one of the things that comes to my mind when I have visited is I try to visualize my friends or my uh, platoon members that are buried there. I always try to go to their, where they're buried uh, the, and just visit and uh, try to remember them and uh, keep them in my prayers a lot. It, it's, it's not, it's a sad moment for me to, to, for them to have been taken away. I, I can visualize the, the members that are there that were killed in action that were close to me. And of course, there's, I don't know how many of the, uh, of the force members are there, but I imagine it's three or 400 of them there at that cemetery, the American cemetery that's uh, the, at the Anzio Beachhead. The Texas War Memorial is one of the outstanding memorials to, to veterans, to the country, uh, and it's one of the leading ones as far as I, my opinion goes of any other one that I've seen, and I've seen all of them in Washington, D.C. I've seen some in uh, Canada, England, France, Italy. But there's no comparison to the way this unit here was planned. The veterans really raised the money for this. Uh, we, the city put up some seed money, but it really was the veterans and through uh, Colonel Plummer and Gene going out there and making sure that uh, people understood the need. And so we wouldn't have this without uh, the efforts of uh, people like Gene and uh, it wouldn't, certainly wouldn't be what it is um, today. And so um, they, they worked tirelessly for that. And uh, um, you know, when they come in the office, it's hard to say no to those great guys. What we have here is the history of every war that our country has been involved with. And what we have here is, is a memorial that honors all the, all the men and women killed in all the different wars that our country has been involved with. This is a regional facility and uh, all the cities participate. And it's a living facility in a way that Unfortunately, we still have memorial services for the newly fallen from our area. We're a very patriotic area and we've lost um, men in every war and women in every war, but we're still, we still have troops in Afghanistan from our area and unfortunately each year uh, we have a memorial for those that are fallen. And so it's a very sacred place, um, it's a very proud place, and it's got a little bit of everything in it. It's um, educational. It's, um, it's sacred from a standpoint of, of the statistics and the feeling and the stories that are here. And also it's a great place for the, our veterans to visit and be a part of the area that we're proud of our veterans and we show it. We started this memorial about 22 years ago, back in 1989. And uh, we have been at it uh, continuously since then. And we're very proud of it. I've known Gene for quite a while. As a matter of fact, uh, he has a property right next to where I live. So I've known him for, for a long time. Uh, and uh, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. We've been friends for a good while. And I'm so proud of what he's done. We're both paratroopers, and that makes me even prouder. So he served in World War II, of course, and uh, did his job and did it very well. We're all very proud. Everybody, everybody here in McAllen in the valley, they know who Gene Gutierrez is. Well, after I came back from the Korean War, went to school, got my uh, education, went into teaching. Gene Gutierrez was my first principal. He gave me my first job. That's how far back we go. That was in 1954. I don't know how many years that is. That's, that's a whole bunch of them. Gene came back from war and became an educator and really uh, contributed to our young folks um, that way on top of his uh, military service. 
You know, Eugene's known for the community uh, primarily because of, of a principal of Lincoln uh, Junior High, and so he has legions of kids that uh, uh, loved him, feared him a little bit, but uh, ended up loving him, I'm sure. Well, being here is a great mental comfort and a, a, a joy and a, and a proudness that we have a historical background here of brave men who gave their lives for the freedom of this country. We have their names here, we have statues, we have uh, benches such as this uh, in which we, have, we write down the names of veterans or, the, or our families. You're looking at the one of the most impressive the monuments, the statues right here in the warrior, we call it, dedicating it to the, those who, who uh, received the Congressional Medal of Honor. Now we have 39, we have two more that we will be adding because of the wars that we are Iraq and, and Afghanistan. And then we uh, are going to be adding 18 more that uh, the, the, that were just added uh, recently. Uh, they did it, conducted a study and decided that they should be given uh, uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor. So we're going to have to get more space in here, but they will all fit. You know, another wall, and uh, it'll be beautiful. It'll be great. I mentioned the fact that if you look at the history of all the Congressional Medal of Honor recipients by ethnic group on a pro rata basis, the Hispanic ethnic group has more Congressional Medal of Honor than any other ethnic group in the history of the United States. And we're proud of the fact that, that this is, this is a, a very high Hispanic uh, population area because we live close to the Mexican border. That's what I wanted to point out and we're proud of that. This one here far surpasses our, our, our war memorial in Washington, D.C. And I say it from the bottom of my heart because I have been to the memorial in Washington twice, but this seems like it has life in it. The uh, force was called into action into Anzio uh, roughly from what I recall, maybe a week or 10 days after the main group went in. So we went into Anzio uh, and were assigned to protect a certain area of the, uh, of the perimeter of the front line. And that was uh, uh, roughly uh, one third of the perimeter of the front. I believe the front was about 22 miles from one end to the other. And uh, the force was responsible uh, roughly for a third of that distance. There were, uh, the other sections were, they had full divisions taken care of. And you know, a division goes 10, 12,000 men. So we were very thinly uh, spread throughout, yet, we carried a big heavy load there. Uh, there was more action, I believe, in our quadrant or our area than the other divisions. At night activity was in the sector of the first special service force because of the uh, Germans, I guess their thought was to drive the Americans into the ocean or back to the, but they always had very tough resistance. During the day at the Anzio Beachhead, you, you had to stay out of sight because the uh, Germans had the high ground and they could detect any movement below. And many times they would uh, call for artillery fire on those targets that they would see. Uh, then they had a big gun that was mounted on railroad, which they, they would bring it out uh, use it, and then they would put the, um, the the big artillery piece back into a cave to protect it from uh, uh, air attack or uh, airplane bombings. Uh, there were many occasions where, uh, even during the day, they would just be shelling indiscriminately all around where we were. 
This is one of the cases where they would target the um, farmhouses because they knew that that's where we were taking cover during the day. And we had several casualties. Uh, uh, some of my buddies that uh, were in one of the uh, farmhouses where I had been staying, I was transferred to another one and the, they took our places there and that following day they, uh, they put a lot of artillery in that house and it killed s several of the uh, men that were inside, especially those that were on the top floor. Uh, I had been in that in that room where there were four of my or five of my uh, buddies from the, my platoon, uh, and we were moved out to another location, and they took our place there. And that next day, they were uh, shelled, and several were were killed. And I, had I been in that room or that sleep in there that day, uh, who knows <laughs> what could have happened. Uh, uh, so thereafter when we would change places, uh, we would always dig under the foundation of the house and would use it as a uh, secure place in case of shelling. It was around the second day after the offensive got started for the liberation of Rome. Uh, we were, uh, had, had dug in uh, that night when we approached the uh, front lines. And uh, shortly after we were dug in, maybe about 12, 1 o'clock, our artillery started shelling the German side. Uh, and they shelled for quite a while. And when about dawn, when we stopped, our artillery stopped, then the Germans started shelling us, and uh, we had dug foxholes, and uh, one of my friends uh, was maybe just about six feet away from me, uh, and uh, he was a little bigger than I was, so I was able to dig a little deeper, faster, and. Uh, when the shelling came and he hadn't finished, so his uh, body was exposed above the level of the ground and uh, there was a burst of, um, uh, art not artillery, but mortar shells that came in and, and he got hit on the butt and uh, immediately uh, he started calling medic, medic, and I couldn't get to him right away, even though he was just uh, five or six feet away because his shelling was pretty heavy. And uh, he said, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding. Uh, I says, I've, uh, I've been hit. So I says, I hollered back, I'll be there as soon as I can, uh, as soon as I feel like it's safe to get out of the foxhole. So I. Shortly thereafter, I did, and I got to him, and he said, I'm, I'm, I'm bleeding a lot between my legs. He says, I think I've been hit in the wrong place. And so, um, <clears throat> you all close your ears. <laughs> uh, so he said, check me, please. So I rolled him over, and uh, well, it, uh, it, I, I just drugged him a little bit and then cut his pants. So I, I saw all the blood coming out. It says, no, you have not been hit in your, in your balls. You've been hit in your butt. You're, that's where you're bleeding from. So I uh, did as much as I could to um, stop the bleeding. And shortly after, we got the, uh, a jeep and put him in a stretcher, and they took him to the first aid station. And uh, it was about 50 years, more or less, in between that moment. Uh, and then when I met again with him, it, it was in one of the reunions that we had. Well, it was in the D Detroit reunion some years back. Uh, I had another buddy that was, uh, he was a, a ranger. He was a replacement. He, 
and he's, I, I had told him about this incident before. Then he came over to me and says, you know that, remember you told me about the guy that you uh, assisted when he got hit between his legs? He says, yeah. Well, we were talking about it and exactly what you told me last year or the, so, he says, so I know that's the guy you want to talk to because he, ex he uh, uh, described the situation the way it was. So I told him, I says, look, I know who this guy was and he's here. So he made arrangements the next day. We met uh, in one of the areas there and we started talking. He asked me, he says, what did I tell you um, to check on me? He says, we, you told me you were bleeding between your legs and you thought your family jewels had been blown away. He says, yeah, I remember that and you're the one. And, Oh, it was a, a moment of of, uh, of um, big surprise and a moment of such uh, delicate situation that we both embraced each other and we started crying a little bit. I was happy that he was still alive and, and uh, he was happy to know that I had given him first aid at that moment. That guy later became a casualty. Uh, he was uh, uh, wounded three or four times during the time that he was uh, overseas. And he was a pretty uh, tough guy too. He, some of his friends had been killed and he, he wanted, always wanted to kill Germans because of his buddies being killed. And uh, he was in, in one of the last operations of the force before it was disbanded up in the, in, in the French Alps. And uh, uh, every reunion we had thereafter, we always looked out to see if we were there together and visited a lot together. I, at Enzio, uh, the farmhouse that we were we took, we took over. The family uh, did not want to leave. So uh, they stayed there and they were very um, congenial. Sometimes they would give us food. And uh, uh, <clears throat> they uh, would always uh, stay, of course, they would stay by, to themselves. But if we needed anything, they were they were accommodated. The uh, uh, people there helped us. One time, we saw a, a stray cow, and we brought it into their barn, and we slaughtered that because we hadn't had any meat for ages, and so uh, we quartered the animal and gave the meat away to the other section of the other guys in the front lines. Uh, and that, so we had fresh meat there for a few days. And uh, the other occasion that was really very um, uh, warm and very, uh, re I still remember it was when we entered Rome and on June 4, as we entered in, people were uh, waiting for us. They knew that we were coming. So as soon as we entered the, the city limits of Rome, people just came out and hugged us and um, being very uh, accommodating. They were so glad to see Americans because the Germans had been very mistreated for them. And they were always pointed out at uh, the rear guard of the German army, there were a lot of snipers trying to hold back the advancement. They, uh, they treated us very well. Some came with uh, bread, giving us bread and, and uh, water or wine uh, to drink. In France, we, uh, we uh, had so much champagne at one time, we, uh, we um, ran into a German quartermaster and they had 
cases and cases of the best champagne that was in France. And uh, everybody that wanted to, they could take a case to their tent, you know. And sometimes in the morning we would, when we were back from the front, we uh, pop corks uh, from the champagne and s to wake up the other guys. <laughs> Wasted a lot of good champagne there. I recall Artina very well. Uh, uh, there were <clears throat> a lot of people who took cover in the caves. Uh, and we established uh, our communications center there at the castle. So we were uh, right in the middle of the big battle that was going on because uh, uh, at night uh, it was tracers going both directions and, and we could feel them and uh, sometimes fire would come into the big castle uh, from the artillery, the German artillery. Uh, there was a case that I had, I volunteered to go into a cave with another buddy of mine. Uh, a civilian came to us uh, one morning there asking for uh, medical aid for a priest that was, he w had been wounded uh, because of the shelling. And the uh, civilian people had taken refuge or cover in a cave uh, that was down below the city of Artina. And uh, they came over and asked her if we could go and see him, see if we could find some type of uh, some medication or something to help him. So we took off uh, some medical supplies. Uh, but when we got to the cave, there were, must have been about 100, 150 people there. And uh, this priest had, had wounds on his legs and uh, he had been wounded uh, maybe a week or so prior to us going there and gangrene had already begun to set in so there wasn't anything we could do. The only thing we told the people and I was able to communicate with them because uh, my background in Spanish uh, I had learned Italian within a week in North Africa. So when we got to Italy, I could communicate with the people fairly well. So I told them, you know, that we didn't have the right uh, supplies or medical help. The only way would be for us to take him with us in a stretcher and get, take him to an American uh, aid station that we had there in Artina. So we put him in the, in the station, we put him in a stretcher and climbed back up the mountain. And uh, when we got to the, to the uh, <clears throat> castle, then we transferred him over to a jeep. And I remember very well as we were going down the side of the, uh, of the mountain there in Artina, uh, we were getting fire from the German side and it's a good thing the jeep was going down uh, with good speed. We got him to, into the uh, aid station. It was late in the evening, and uh, they, the, our medics took care of him. Uh, what happened to him after that, I, I don't know, but I'm sure they gave him the right medication and took care of his wounds. And uh, there was another case there <clears throat> where we had to go in. There was an American tank right in, in town uh, that was hit by German artillery. And we ran over to try and get the people out, but uh, uh, they perished in the fire of the tank inside. They could, never could get out. Uh, Well, I had a very, a very special friend also, uh, who was wounded in France, uh, and uh, he was in very bad shape. Uh, he was uh, right in a jeep, and there was a, a landmine that exploded, and there was five of them in the jeep, and uh, out of the five, uh, three were killed 
at that moment, and he survived, but he was blown uh, from the uh, concussion or the explosion into a ravine. And they, when they came to look for them, they couldn't find him. And uh, they almost left him there for dead uh, because they didn't know where his body was. But luckily, uh, through some grace, they spotted him down below, I don't know, about 20, 30 feet from the edge of the road where he had his body had rolled over. And, uh, and that was uh, a case where from there on, he was always in and out of hospitals for over 30 or 40 years. And he passed away not, oh, about two years ago. Uh, and he's one that we were very close and we kept pretty close contact after the war. I did a lot of, lot of praying in that uh, 11 days going up uh, through the mountains and into, and into Rome. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I look back at some of my friends that uh, uh, were killed in action on the way over, and uh, it's uh, the only thing I can think is to remember them in in a very special prayer that I do that I have, and hoping that uh, they're resting in peace. I saw so many of them stayed over there, uh, killed in action. That it's. You, f you feel like, well, you can't, you get used to that, but you don't, you know, losing friends like that. It's pretty sad, and uh, it, it makes me think, well, I guess the Lord had a place for them to go, and I wasn't called yet. It's the only uh, reply that I have is, uh, they paid for their lives, and I was spared, and uh, I'm thankful to the Lord. And it's it, it's kind of hard to 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 explain things like that uh, uh, deep in my heart. I, I feel very sorry uh, about losing them. Uh, and I don't say that I'm the, a lucky one because I'm not a lucky one. Uh, I'm just uh, another person that was uh, uh, came back alive. Yeah. When we arrive or visit the Italian campaign sites, uh, I I hope that I can relate to some of the people uh, that were there at that time because. Uh, Seventy years is a, quite a span of time to, to wish that there would be people there that were at that time when we were there. In the past uh, we ha that we have done that, uh, the people that are there, of course, are younger people, and they have no concept as to what happened uh, during the operations that we w went through the town. They, the uh, civilian people in Italy appreciate the Americans. They have been very uh, complimentary, very thankful that we were able to uh, liberate them from the uh, German regime. My goal is to reach 100 years old and still be able to make do 100 push-ups. For his age, he's in such good shape. He's physically, you know, I watched him on Ridge 368 the other day. And we were there on December 3rd. And I know that's a tricky area where we place that plaque in memory of the men of 1st Regiment who suffered a 40% casualty rate on December 3rd, 43, while 2nd Regiment was taking uh, the main mountain of Monila Defensa. But I watched Eugene and how he picked his way around those rocks, because it's kind of a difficult area. It's dark and it's, there's loose rocks and anyway, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to hold him, but 
he would have held me going up there, the way he walked. He's nimble, he's got good balance. And I know as I get older, my balance is a little bit suspect. And uh, his was good. So whatever he does, you know, his workout, we know he works out. We know he does uh, uh, a lot of uh, push-ups. And uh, matter of fact, I might have to get him to do one on uh, one of these battlefields for us, just to show us all that he can do it. I have been using the this stool for the last uh, 32, 35 years to do my morning routine of exercising. Uh, uh, count of 100 up and downs but in different positions and I stretch out my legs as far as I can and then I uh, continue using it. Then I get on my knees and uh, stretch my uh, arms and my uh, upper chest and then I strengthen my uh, wrists in this way I hold it then I hold it up like this this and go for a, a count of sometimes 30 times and then I put a lot of strength a lot of stress on my uh, uh, wrist to strengthen my hands. After I finish that routine, <clears throat> then I also sometimes, and not all the time, I have a system of doing some swimming with this, going through the procedure of uh, using my legs, my arms, and simulate swimming. I normally go about 50 strokes like this. Then I switch over to my right side to get my right side to be as strong as my left side. I practice this almost every morning, but I do a simulate jogging, putting strength pushing down and then pushing my body up. Then I do side training like this. And uh, then I do both of my legs at the same time. Like this. After this, then I go to the floor. When I get uh, on the floor, I start stretching my uh, arms and putting stress on my back legs at the same time. Then I go up like this and start warming up my muscles for my push-ups. Then I get on my back and I start my back exercises to strengthen my, my back and my knees. Uh, the way I do it is lay flat. Then I bring my leg over and bring it up as high as I can into the area of my legs, with the crotch area. And I normally count uh, 15 and rest, and then I bring it back again. And after that, I pull my, my legs as far back, touching my back of my butt, and then I put it down and start exercising the thighs in here. And then I do counter uh, strength here by pushing on my leg as much as I can and hold it. And, and then I bring this over and pull all the muscles in my upper legs and in my waist. I try to do the same on both legs so they will be evenly developed. So then I go into my finale. 
which is doing my push-ups. So, if you want to count, go ahead. <laughs> okay. One, two, three, four. Ten, three. Ninety. One hundred. <sighs> right now I'm catching my breath. Takes me about two to three minutes to get my heartbeat back to normal. <laughs> Is that all you got? Yeah. <laughs> You're next. <laughs> uh,